chat. We're delighted to be joined by Amanda Kirby today, or should I say Professor Amanda Kirby today. Um, and we've not got any Deborah today because she's been in China at the Huawei Connect conference um, and is probably suffering from extreme jet lag. But Antonio's here with us, joining us from Copenhagen. So uh, thank you, Amanda. It's, it's great to have you with us. I've been chatting to you over the last few months about neurodiversity and uh, the work that you're doing across a wide range of areas. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your background and how you came to be working in the space? Sure. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to chat today. Um, my background is a, as a GP and um, changed career really because of my middle child was neurodiverse and I needed to find answers to try and support him as a child and an adult. Then developed uh, a clinical background and did research in this area and then about 10-15 years ago as I was seeing children had not just one area of challenge, but they had different areas of challenges and strengths as well, started developing computer-based systems for starting to screen and identify and support people, not just for their challenges, but also their strengths as well. And then from there, really needed to develop tools that were contextually appropriate. So that might be in the workplace, in schools, in prisons, because actually the guidance and support you have is different in different settings. So from there, it's really expanded into developing suites of screening and assessment tools for children and adults and working in lots of different sectors. Yeah, I, I, I know, you know we, we've talked at length about working in the, the sort of prison sector. There's a huge mm, proportion mm. of uh, the prison population that, that have some degree of neurodiversity um, so tell us a bit more about the, the, how you would apply the tools and, and what you do to in, in order to hopefully you know, improve people's outcomes yeah. uh, well, in the justice system. Well, neurodiversity, if we look at the general population, about one in eight people in the general population, about one in four people are unemployed. And it was thought to be about one in three people in the prison system. And many of those individuals come into the prison system and they've never had their needs identified. And the reason for that is the reason why some people don't have their needs identified. About 30% uh, of them will have been looked after children and two thirds will have been excluded from school. So they'll be out of the school system. And when we've gone in there, we started oh, 10 plus years ago, starting with paper based and, uh, and then uh, uh, computerizing the tools. We started screening and, and checking and identifying, but providing support to those individuals uh, on day one when they're arriving. And so we started trialing that uh, during that time. And then, uh, and then now, excuse me one second. Can you pause it a second? Not possible. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's okay. It's a live recording. Oh dear. <laughs> if you need to go and pick up the broken glass, that's. <laughs> we'll, cut, to... we'll, we'll cut it out afterwards. Can you? <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the office. So it's real life, but it really is. And, and because I'm distractible, I'm hearing people moving around and, and things breaking. So, so apologies. Okay, let me go back. Okay. So start, started screening uh, people in prison ten plus years ago, and at that point we started seeing that actually it wasn't around thirty percent. It was forty fifty percent of people coming through who'd not had their needs identified. We were able to provide them with person centered support for them and also for their staff. And that was important because part of what we found is that staff in the prisons didn't have a knowledge around neurodiversity as well and were waiting for to support somebody who had a diagnosis. And what we were doing is actually no, because uh, maybe they don't hit the radar sufficiently to get the diagnosis, yet they've got lots of difficulty in a number of ways. I can explain that a bit more by thinking about balls in buckets, okay? So yes, please. we get, yep, okay. So we have different colored balls in our buckets which represent our strengths and challenges. And if we have, say we have lots of colored blue balls which have got reading, a a spelling, writing. And if you have enough of those blue balls, you get a diagnosis for dyslexia. The reality is what we've worked out over the last few years is neurodiversity is lots of mixture of lots of different colored balls. And that's the reality of each person. So one person might have some red balls, 
attention concentrations and spelling balls. They might have a green ball in terms of working with people in a group. But actually systems really look at people in channels. They look at single colors. So you only look at dyslexia and you don't look at the ADHD traits, or you only look at autism and you don't look at dyspraxia traits. And what we found is in the prison population particularly, a lot of people there have multicolored balls, they've got lots, but not always sufficient to hit a radar, so they never get their needs identified, yet actually cumulatively they've got a lot of impact which has an impact on their mental well-being and success in education and employment. So we're now being used in widespread in prisons to identify and screen people for neurodiversity, provide them with practical support and the staff with practical support and tools to know how to help them meet their potential and hopefully in the end become a better success in education as well. Excellent. And, and I've, uh, I've seen you've been blogging on LinkedIn about the buckets and, and for me this is, this is quite, quite personal because I've been going through that whole sort of journey myself where I've had mm. one diagnosis and then now I'm going to end up with another one um, where there isn't there hasn't been that kind of holistic approach and and no. you've also developed or are developing a a screening tool that runs on mobile phones which is gives people the opportunity to uh, go through a, a quiz and and at least get an idea of where they're um, where their different strengths and, and, and um, difficulties lie and what that might indicate. Can you tell us a bit more about that as well? Sure. So one of the things that's been a real barrier for lots of people, and you know, the prison's one, but actually adults, quite a lot of adults, arriving now going, oh, I understand neurodiversity, that's a bit like me, but I haven't got 400, 600, 800, 1,000 pounds for an assessment. And do I need it or not? And I don't know where to go. So there's a sort of all or nothing. So there's an adult services, say for ADHD or dyspraxia, are really patchy around the UK. So the, it started from the premise of cost affordable, accessible, provide you with something which looks at your strengths as well as your challenges and a starting point for having a conversation with somebody else and for you to reflect on, OK, that's me as a whole. And so we developed the ND app, which is for um, adults post 16, and we're just about to launch in the next few weeks children's ones from seven all the way through and then a developmental one. And my premise for that is something is that at the moment, you, if you think you might be dyslexic or you think you might have ADHD or you think like yourself, Neil, you, you, you've got dyslexia, but somebody else now has told me these bits, oh, that's a bit like me and this is a bit like me, and actually getting a holistic view of who you are and how to support yourself is really difficult and it's impossible to have, virtually impossible to have a neurodiverse assessment as a whole. And so that's why we developed the apps that are cost effective and accessible for everybody. Um, Man, you mentioned about the, the, the fact that people that were uh, in prison and were, were being diagnosed. Uh, when that happens, will that uh, diagnose will help them to with the training or any type of uh, mm. skills mm. that they will go to? Mm. Yes, it does. So the information is, is going from that initial screening, it's going to a number of different places. The report goes to education. So the education providers, the teachers, the trainers have that information so they understand that person has difficulties with spelling, they have difficulties with turn taking, they find it harder to be in a group. So they've got a picture of that person practically on day one and with practical strategies, because that's really important, of how to support that individual. The individual also gets that guidance so they know personal strategies for themselves, how to maximize their support, their skills and minimize those difficulties. It also goes uh, up on now onto the, the wings where the, the people are living. And that goes in the UK with developing key worker systems. And that means the prison officer immediately has something short and brief. They can have start to understand that person. And it contains things about their background, their, their life a bit as well. So they can have a more meaningful discussion with that individual to know how to support them. So very pragmatic. And the resources that are with Profiler include things like fact sheets and voice files and little videos that are accessible. Um, and, and I think, we, you know, sometimes we want to be so clever, actually practical stuff. 
I need help with turn taking, I need help with spelling, I need help. And sometimes we go, let's get the diagnosis. But actually, on the way, the practical stuff is the bit that's going to help you here and now. And that's what we're doing. But the data, the big data, and we've screened more than 25,000 people in the prisons now, is really helping to shape and look at what are the patterns to, with association with things like mental health and self-harm and uh, you know, well-being are then helping to start to target, okay, those patterns are important for us to understand. So it provides the data for research and also targeting future services. And is there already enough data um, that uh, can tell us the impact uh, of, uh, of that, that is having in people returning back to prison? Um, well, it, that's an interesting question. The, the difficulty is the tool is, I would say, you, you need a good driver to drive your car. And so how it's being used, where it's being used, and the information when they come out of prison is the next bit of that, that puzzle. So what we have to do now is we're starting to work with uh, probation, youth services, uh, in, we're working into employment, and we have to start by now following people out uh, and that hasn't been particularly done till now. We're starting that, that process to say, okay, exactly that. If we support people, but it, our tools are part of it because the support we're targeting might be finding housing. It might be targeting that they need to go and see their doctor. Um, it might be about relationships. It might be about debt management. And that's what the tools targeting and providing the, the important information for that person but the systems have to support that person as well. So the tool is part of the solution. It's not the solution. You know, it's got to be integrated into the services that people pick that up and help signpost people appropriately and in a timely manner. But you think that if the application of the knowledge about the the people leaving prison is put to good use, that it's likely to hopefully uh, reduce recidivism rates because yeah. people are going into employment rather than falling out again. And yeah. so I guess the next step, steps are to you know, do a kind of longitudinal study on some of this to to verify that because I, I, yes. I'm very I'm, I'm very interested in not just longitudinal studies of this but long-term efficacy of programs like this where we're taking a holistic view because as yep. you say you know you've got these diagnoses in silos yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we've also got systems that are siloed so yes. you've got you've got you've got multiple different silos so you've got the the silos of of you know your diagnosis your condition or your diagnos diagnosis of these various conditions you've got the silos of the uh, the prison system the probation system the the courts uh, systems and then the you know the multiple different silos of different employers. I mean, for goodness sake, we're Antonio and I both working in a large company, 110,000 employees. We know plenty about silos, even within one employer. So um, finding out ways of doing this, and I think joining stuff together is really something that that is of interest to me. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of the whole sort of benefits and support infrastructure around disability as a whole, mm -hmm. not just neurodiversity. But I think that, that what you're, the approach that you're taking where um, you're looking at intersectionalities of, of neurodiversity could equally apply to intersectionalities of disability because I mean, you're, you're already doing that with mental health and, and other bits as well. So, it, and we are more broader than, and neurodiversity is the place where I've come from, it's my background yeah. and, and research and clinically, but actually it's a person-centered approach. So, uh, you know, so our tools, some of our tools are used in universities for screening all the students coming through. So some of the, and, and some of the modules that are in there are things like study skills, well-being. That's just as applicable to somebody who is neurodiverse as somebody who isn't neurodiverse. So it, the, the solution we're trying to, because neurodiversity or this umbrella of in the past, you've got ADHD, dyslexia, all separate silos. We're saying, actually, the rationale for supporting somebody is their pattern of strengths and challenges. And actually, that is as applicable to somebody who has got cerebral palsy or somebody who's got depression or somebody who's in a wheelchair and has got a physical disability. In each person's profile 
of strengths and challenges is contextually driven to where they're living, what they're doing, what their background is, and what their current challenges are. So the concept is exactly the same. We've worked with into employment, and mm -hmm. they're screening everybody who's coming through and, to, and then providing them with the support they need in terms of employability skills, training skills, and then looking what the gaps are. So it, it actually is just as applicable, it really is. Yeah. You know, um, as long as you take a person-centered view, the, the biggest barrier really often is, um, as you said, Neil, professional silos, data management. Sometimes the barrier is people are worried about how the data is going to be handled and where it's going to go. It's sometimes about training. So uh, we embed staff, tra we embed training tools into the systems as well. So if somebody's never heard of neurodiversity, how do they know the value of why we're doing this? So we'd embed information about that and why take this sort of approach into the system as well. But it is around, it's about services are often separate and they use different language as well. So in the past, we've had hidden impairments, specific learning difficulties, developmental disorders, neurodiversity, you know, developmental disorders, all these different terms, the language needs to be consistent that we're talking about people and understanding the person. And that's still a challenge. Um, I'm, I'm also interested when you're talking about going into business uh, mm -hmm. about sort of finding people's strengths because uh, as, as a business money is reliant on people being productive and yep. um, I think it's it's I've, I've done a number of um, sort of personality profiling tools and now there's a lot of criticism on on internet at the moment about <laughs> some of these. You know, the MBTI has now been called the the business equivalent of astrology. Um, but 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 at the same time, um, I I think that some of these these things help you and help teams understand each other to and understand the dynamics of teams. So can you know the, the profiling actually? be a way of finding people's strengths and, and, and maybe m more to at a, at a wider level rather than just at profiling how do we get businesses and employers to to stop asking everybody to be generalists because we we've, we've had this thing um i think in recent years where you know we've gone oh look you've got a computer so you can do all your own admin now you can mm -hmm. you can do you know the computer's going to mean that you, you you can do a bit of everything badly um yeah, badly <laughs> and 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 so i do a lot of things badly now that that previously maybe uh, we would have found um that people had specialisms for so so do you think there is a an opportunity to revisit um, how we do work and look at, at, at revisiting specialisms and everything else because I think that this whole sort of generalism thing is actually probably quite stressful for a lot of people and, and not actually getting the best out of everyone. No, so I think that I think if, if we harness the talent, so if we look at a profile and you say you're really good analytically or you're really good at a communicator, we want to add, try and capture those. And I suppose a challenge comes in two ways. One, if you've got deep difficulties in one area, so and you're having to write and record reports, and it's really problematic. And that's where accessible technology can come in and help. So, so the if your spike is up here, but your dip is down there, how do we pull this up to help you maximise your talent? And that's about you as an individual profile. I think in the workplace, what's going to be smart, and we're just talk, mapping of this out and starting a project at the moment, is how do we work effectively building those profiles and put, putting them together to start saying, well, actually, I like to communicate in this way, this is how, and this is how I understand, because the analytical skills and the, the very expanding communicators sometimes clash. And actually, if we're looking in the creative industries or in technical industries or, or STEMs, it doesn't matter because actually you're going to have a mixture of talents. The next stage through is how do we effectively communicate in the styles that marry each other? And that's taking your neurodiverse profiles, maximize, minimizing your challenges and maximizing the spikes, and then saying, actually, we can work together to know how we best communicate. And I think there is a basis, there is a basis for that. 
and it moves away from I think it's the next stage of some of the um, mapping that's been done by companies to say how do teams work and it's a part of that but it's also more re internally reflective and you can say some of this is like, like astronomy but sometimes reflecting on how you do things uh, is useful isn't it yeah. you know self-reflection Astrology. Yeah, think, you said astrology, yes, astrology and I said astrology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still looking in the stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah but I think the there's a bit more science. I think there's a bit more science to the astronomy. Um, yeah, true. Yeah. Okay. So, but I think, so, I think there's yeah. a way to go, but I think technology could help with that. And I think because of accessible forms of communication, like we're talking here now, you know, but for some people, that might be quite hard to talk without a format and a frame to yes. work to. Um, understanding that beforehand might drive different conversations. So I think we can get better at doing that and understanding that, the differences. No, I think that's particularly important because sometimes today we, everyone is expected to communicate um, and participating in, especially at, at work, in, in somehow in the same way. You know, enterprises are, are deploying communication solutions and everyone is expected to use the same and, and, to, and to be present and to be visible when I think it's, it's important to also to provide space where people can communicate using those tools but also in, in a way that works for them. This could be by using, using integrating other solutions that then can link to those, to those let's say, messaging systems but uh, somehow a software that, that can make that link, but that is comfortable for them to use, or, or uh, also finding a way where managers can respect their own times and the way how they like to communicate or be part of the team and not be judged by, by, the, by their decision, because today people are being evaluated by that. And I think that's a really important point, Antonio, because actually still when, if you start right at the beginning of applying for a job, and it takes up your point, Neil, as well, is there's an expectation of, at the bottom of the job description, there's other, which is actually lots of things that could be asked of you. And you often you're asked to be uh, flexible, and you're asked to be lots of different things. I think having a more refined understanding of an individual's profile allows for line managers to have a better um, a discussion to say this is this is what this is what I want this is how I work best this is how I work best as a line manager and you're having that reflective discussion up front rather than waiting for the problems to occur and I think the, the, the thing is with improved accessible technology we have got the means of now you know uh, providing emails we can put them in bold we can put them in color we can use skype for communication we can write notes in chat you know to reinforce what we're saying we've got lot, we have a lot of choices about how we communicate and i think it's about those having those discussions openly you know it starts even at interviews how are we judged for a job in an interview which is hugely biased. If you are good at communicating, it's brilliant, but you might not actually be any good at your job. That's the reality of the situation. Or, or you, and we've had that, people who've been brilliant at interviews and rubbish in their job. The reverse of that, you might be taking somebody on for their technical skills, but they're never going to be customer facing. They don't need to be brilliant at communication, yet they still have to go through the same interview process. So I think that even doing that up front to find out what's the best base, basis of bringing somebody on in into your company changes the face of how you do things. We've just been working with a large organization doing reverse job matching. So where there we've been going in and profiling people who are doing the job already and then creating job descriptions to marry with the people who are doing the job. And what we found there was actually the people doing the job qualifications didn't make any difference. So, it, you know, those who had master's degree who, who didn't have, uh, you know, A-levels or, or, or many GCSEs still didn't flag up who was doing the job the best. And it actually created job descriptions which married much more to the job itself rather than actually saying, here's an HR job, here's an admin job, and taking one off the shelf, which is often what we do. We just tweak it. Mm -hmm. So I think and, and technology can really frame much more getting the right people in the right jobs as well. So, and this is this is interesting to me. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in companies where they're looking at, at um, 
you know finding the right fit um mm -hmm. and and so antonius just posted in the window about cultural fit uh, and i think that's true and sometimes we worry too much about cultural fit and and you end up with homogeneity uh rather than um rather than the sort of diversity that you really need um and and yes some of that's down to you know communication preferences and, and so on and so forth but i'm i'm also interested in this whole idea of yeah what is the job description what does it mean uh, are our job descriptions fit for purpose we're looking at this from a slightly different point of view at the moment uh, using technology to remove bias in the language of the description so um, you know we've, we've already done gender bias we're now looking at disability bias um, but one of the things that um, I'm concerned about is there has been talk already about how when you use AI to find people that match people that are successful already, what you end up with is um, more of the same and less diversity. So how how do we use this kind of technique for finding out what it is that makes someone good at a job um, without then building in bias into the technology we then build on top of it? I think you're you're right. Well, at the moment, if we, if we turn it turn it on its head a moment, Noel, and say, what do we do sure. now? Right. So our current systems are hugely biased. So if you are literate and you can fill in a good CV and you can communicate well in uh, in an interview, uh, you are going to be more likely to get a job, even that the job doesn't require those skills per se. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that we're excluding, if I'm looking at neurodivergent talent, we're, we're excluding a lot of people who don't even apply to, have, to go for the job because it doesn't look like they've got the skill set. So we're, at the moment, we've got a lot of uh, bias in organizations and their recruitment procedures. I think these sort of tools help um, to have some consistency in being opening up the potential for you to be able to do something which isn't based on such a narrow box. So what you're starting to see, it, what's happened in the company where we've been doing this is it's opened up the conversation to say, well, actually, the things we thought were barriers to somebody getting a job, we're taking those barriers down. Uh, it goes back to your culture fit, but it's also about how welcoming mm -hmm. you are as an organization um, in having a conversation beforehand to make sure that, so it's, it's interviewing in a very different way. I wouldn't use these tools as the only tool for putting no. somebody through a system. Okay. That would be very wrong and it would be narrowing. I think that you, on your website, on your information you have, on the way that you choose your application form, the words you use, you're talking about gender bias in applications and, and changing the language. This starts the opportunity to change the language to make it less uh, disability unfriendly as well and invites people in to apply that they may never have applied before. So I think it's actually yeah. opening it up rather than closing it down. Okay, that's really interesting. We've reached the end of our half an hour and I need to thank all of the people that help us sustain Access Chat. So my clear text, Barclays Access and, and Microlink PC. Um, thank you, Amanda. I'm really looking thank forward you. to you joining us on, on Twitter. I look forward to it too. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you very much, Antonio.